Next, I'd like to invite Sean Gorman to the stage. <laughs> All, all, all height types at OSM. Um, yeah, no, thanks so much, Maggie, for, is it a little closer? There we go. Cool, is that better? All right. Um, yeah, thanks, thanks, Maggie, for the intro, and thanks for, uh, for giving me a chance to talk. Uh, I want to discuss a little bit about a project we've been working on for the last uh, year and a half or so to see if we can improve positioning on GPS for field mapping um, and, and other applications as well. Uh, you know, and one of the things, uh, and I'll, I'll probably date myself a fair bit, like the first time I went to doing an OSM event mapping party, it was a suitcase full of GPS receivers, and we went out and walked every segment that we're going to go into. Is it better? Like that? Okay, cool. Um, and, uh, and it was a lot of fun, because we got to meet up in person, and we got to use equipment, but, you know, it was, it was pretty janky and, uh, uh, and, and challenging on multiple fronts. Um, and you know, one of the limitations of going further with that, uh, where you know, mapping through something like ID, where you have imagery and you can trace across it, is that GPS is kind of terrible um, when it comes to the accuracy of what you can get off your smartphone. On one hand, we all have smartphones, which is fabulous. Uh, the, the downside is, especially when you get into a city and you have a lot of big buildings around, the accuracy of that point um, tends to drift quite a bit. Um, so this is a, a cool graphic that Foursquare did a couple of years ago. And the, uh, the buildings are, uh, like in green, that somebody checked into that building on Foursquare. So we know that they were at that building or inside the building when they checked in. And then the GPS is where it said they were when they checked in. Uh, and so you can see the number of green things that are actually near the building or in the building is quite low. The number of green things that are everywhere else other than that building is quite high. Uh, and so for a whole lot of, of mapping purposes, you know, we'd love to be able to use these sensors that we have in our phone to make a better and more complete map, understand POIs, understand streets, uh, map sidewalks, street furniture, all these other great things. Um, but the accuracy of that phone in your pocket limits the number of things that we can map in a, in a lot of significant ways. Um, and there's been some really cool work of trying to get around this. There was a talk at, uh, by An Antoine Rich at State of the Map EU uh, last year, I believe, where they created a, an RTK mapping system kind of from scratch. There's a, an open base station network. And if you're not familiar, RTK is like what you use for surveying GPS. So there's a receiver, which is what's inside that backpack, and he also has a camera on top of it. And then that receiver connects to a base station. And that base station is you know, either by the US government or somebody like Trimble or Hexagon. And it has a super precise precision. And it sends an error correction to that rover in the backpack. And then you do some differentials to remove the error. And you get this really precise like couple of centimeter level accuracy. And so it's really popular in surveying, very expensive equipment. Uh, you know, what Antoine presented was fabulous. But he found a, a low cost way of doing that. But you're still talking a couple hundred bucks at least, and some pretty uh, you know, technical skill sets to put together what he did to, to pull that off. But you can see the impact, right? You can see the mapping before it was all squiggly and jumping across the road. And when they used his RTK system, it becomes very smooth and nice, and the precision is quite good. And that, that becomes really great content for mapping versus the, uh, the, the GPS data that was coming off the phone. Um, and this has been like an overall challenge that a lot of people in technology and around smartphones have been trying to solve for a while. Can you do RTK level precision on a smartphone, or at least get close to it? Uh, Google's had a thing called the Decimeter Challenge for the last, they've had three, three challenge, Kaggle challenges where they've tried to solve this, uh, but the best result in the last one was like 1.2 meters, so not like a huge improvement, uh, and that's like open road, open sky kind of scenario. Um, so not you know, quite getting to the, the level that we'd wanna see on something like Antoine's project. Um, and so we've been taking an uh, approach that's a little bit different uh, that instead of trying to improve the accuracy on one phone using something like a base station, um, the team had this really cool idea of, you know, what if we took measurements from a whole bunch of phones, and we took all the measurements from the phones, and we put it into an ensemble and tried to run an optimization to see if we could figure out the best way to combine all of those signals together. Um, and, and we'd previously been working on a project where we were trying to take street view imagery and create 3D models for doing augmented reality kind of at city scale. 
Uh, and the team had come up with a really cool set of mathematics for doing that. And the idea was, well, can we take those computer vision mathematics and apply them to GNSS data? And the same way we were trying to get you know, a 3D world to co-register from a, scans from a whole bunch of different people, could we also use satellite measurements from a whole bunch of different people to get it to converge on reality? Um, and basically the, the way that this works is, normally when you have your phone, it's pointing up to the sky, and if you're like downtown Salt Lake City, there's buildings that are preventing like the line of sight where that measurement's gonna go directly to your phone. Because the whole way GPS, GNSS works is you're trying to estimate the distance between you and a satellite. And the more precisely you can estimate that distance, the more precise your location becomes. But if your signal is bouncing off a building, then it becomes longer than it should be, and then that measurement's off. And then that causes the position to be off. So that's why like when you're in New York and you get out of the subway, uh, all of a sudden your blue dot's roaming all over the place because the signals are bouncing all over and you're not getting good distance measurements and it screws you up your trilateration. So the idea is like, you know, you might be blocked, but there's a whole bunch of people in the park uh, that are playing Pokemon Go and getting, you know, great signals. You know, could you share your signals with uh, the person who's blocked to help them get better measurements? Because um, if you can get really good measurements from D, C, and B, you can use those to correct A um, is the basic kind of mathematical concept. Uh, so we did a bunch of this in simulation and it worked great. And then we tried to go do it with real phones and it was crap and terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Nine months later, we got this <laughs> and it wasn't terrible anymore. Um, and I'll, I won't bore you with the details, but basically the, uh, the green and the yellow, one's a Pixel phone, one's a Samsung phone, uh, and then blue is when we're running, running our software on top of it, doing the cooperative positioning and measurements. Um, and kind of a better way to look at this is like as a radar plot. Um, so on the left is the, uh, uh, is the Samsung single band phone. So it's sitting around like two, two meters open sky. The next one is uh, um, a, a dual band um, Google phone. It's also sitting around two meters and we were able to get down to about 50 centimeters or so. Um, so that's pretty exciting and, and we did that test like back in November. Uh, and since then we've been you know, continuing to broaden out. So open sky is kind of the easiest one. Uh, but it's kind of the benchmark everybody uses because it's consistent. Um, and so we also created one for CU Boulder where we went to like where there's tunnels and big buildings and stadiums around CU Boulder's campus because it was the biggest buildings close by um, and use that as our urbanish uh, test. And then we have one on a Mesa where it's just stationary phones. Uh, and then we have two tests, one using Pixel phones, one using Samsung phones where we use a, a football field where we can see measurements and use the track and there's nice lines and kind of compare that. Um, and so you see, like, kind of over time, we've been able to drive down those, uh, those errors. You have total error, which is X, Y, and Z. So it's the altitude as well as the horizontal latitude and longitude. And then geodetic is just flat, flat earth uh, latitude and longitude errors. Um, so they're like in the urban scenarios, um, you know, about one and a half meters. Uh, and then, you know, for static in the high 30 centimeters and then right around 50 centimeters for the other ones, which was all pretty exciting. Uh, so what does this mean when you're actually out there mapping? Um, so hopefully you can see this. The, the red line there is this is one of the CU urban, urban areas where we're going through some big buildings and woods and so forth. So the, the yellow line there is the ground truth, an RTK survey system we're like we were talking about. The blue line is the cooperative positioning stuff from Zephyr that we're running. And then red is what the Google Fuse Location Provider is giving you. Um, so you can see the nice thing here is like we actually can see where the sidewalk is. The track stays on the sidewalk, whereas Google's pushing it off into the road. Um, and so just kind of like, you know, some of the basic stuff of like you want to map lanes, you want to map these like really fine-grained things, you begin to have the accuracy to, to start to do that. Um, and then here's the same thing, uh, basically plotting total error in 3D. So this is with the Z-axis as well. Um, and so basically plotting these in 3D. So the, the total error for that position is just a bar that goes straight up. And, and you can kind of see as we add in the cooperative position, we're able to squash that error down. So in total, it, for total error, it goes from you know, just south of 10 meters to right about two and a half meters, so about a four and a half times improvement or so. Uh, and then the other thing you can kind of see here is um, doing this, you can also do various, you know, CE50 is 50% of the error is under, is under a number, or you can do 95% is under a number, so you wanna make sure you don't have any outliers in it. Um, so here is kind of a zoom in of one of those. We can see it goes from about five meters to about you know, just below 80 centimeters or so. Um, so this is all super encouraging, you know, especially like the urban stuff is more challenging than the open sky, but starting to see those converge and getting closer together. And basically our goal is to be able to get below a meter 
anywhere, no matter what the, the kind of urban scenario looks like. Um, so a big part of this is we were talking about doing the RTK piece, and basically we're getting relative distances between all the phones, the same way you'd get a relative distance between a phone and a base station um, to do it, except for we're using, instead of time to converge, we're using a large spatial distribution of phones to converge on, on reality. Um, so those measurements between the phones ends up being the thing that really drives how well the system can work. Uh, but the cool thing is the, the team just had a big breakthrough on this just last week. Um, and before, for those results that I was showing you, um, for the 50 centimeter result, it was that before line. And you can see, you know, the relative distances are, are decent, but, and they're getting better and converging, uh, but there's still a lot of variation in it. Um, but we added in a, in a, in a new filter um, for, for managing that a lot better. And it went from, you know, a one and a half meter average to about a 38 centimeter average. Um, and then we, so that was, you can see there's a little blip there at the end. Basically there was a satellite outage that caused a reset. Um, so we also ran it on a, on a second, we had a Samsung data set and a Pixel data set. Uh, we ran it on the Pixel data set, it jumped down even lower. It was sitting like at 17 centimeters. Uh, so the really cool thing about this, we need to get it into the production system so we can run it on, on some of these uh, you know, urban data sets as well. Uh, but the positive thing is it looks like we can get pretty close to RTK, RTK level accuracy with a phone, um, especially for open sky, that looks super good. Getting that to work for urban areas is, is the next step to really get the urban areas below a meter all the time. Um, but, the, but the cool thing is it's, it's looking very, very close and possible. Um, so the problem that we see this from a mapping perspective is you know, using GPS for field mapping can be inaccurate and wildly can inconsistent from what we saw from that Foursquare example. And tracing, you know, satellite and aerial imagery is great until the, you know, the imagery provider yanks it away, and then that makes it problematic. Also, all of those different imagery providers are doing different orthorectifications with different CE90 or CE, you know, whatever accuracy metrics. So, you know, it might be relative for that image, it looks good, but once you trace for something else from another provider, it has a different offset and different relativity. And so you're constantly trying to put these things together and you have error just baked into the baseline orthorectification that's generally three to five meters or so. Um, and so we think you know, being able to bring in another source of ground truth is super helpful. And it actually could be useful for orthorectifying the imagery also. If we're getting you know, kind of 50 centimeter, submeter accuracy with OSM traces, then we could potentially be aligning the imagery to that which could then also help create more consistency across the data set. Um, and also, it's just great to go out and do mapping and, uh, and to be out there with the community, which I really miss from the early days of OSM, that there's just a lot of local context that you get by being there on the ground, whether it's for trail mapping or urban mapping. There's just some things you can't see in imagery um, as great as like Mapillary and Cardicam and other things are. Um, so basically, our, our goal for providing something to the mapping community is like, can we you know, get 50 centimeter and below for open sky? Can we get you know, below a meter everywhere for urban areas. Can we do that with no new hardware, right? As cool as like uh, Antoine's rig is, the number of us that can go out and replicate that rig is small, but just about all of us have a phone in our pocket, right? Um, and hopefully, like right now, Android gives us the data we need to do this. We just gotta convince Apple to do the same and then we get more mappers. Um, and the other, other side is obviously for, for OpenStrap, it needs to be free to use. Um, and so that kind of comes to the last point you know, how can we engage and make this service available to the open, uh, open street map community? Uh, basically in our, uh, you know, post-processing engine that runs all this, uh, and we also have a real-time one, uh, basically we've baked in the ability to push out OpenStreetMap XML for any of the traces that go into it. You know, is there better ways to make that data available, potentially ways to batch it out? Um, and then we also built a, uh, an app for testing where we, we send people to go out and collect data and then we test accuracy and do post-processing. Is it helpful to potentially open source that app and, and make it available? Are there other apps? Because basically the SDK will hook into any app. You know, what's, what's the best apps that we could be hooking into to make the service available for, for OSM mappers? Uh, so if folks have ideas on that or feedback, we'd love to hear it. Um, but overall, yeah, it's a super fun project to work on and uh, definitely one of the hardest things we've tried to do as a group. Um, but but really rewarding and engaging as well. Uh, so if anybody has like, any feedback or ideas and ways we can help, uh, this is my contact info and we'll be around for the rest of the week or weekend. Thanks so much. <laughs> <laughs>